thank you all for having me. I'm really excited about this. Uh, I hope that you will you will enjoy this. Um, by the end of the second half of the 18th century, the figure of Venus had become vivid in the mind's eye of the British public. As Britain's gaze turned south towards ancient Greece and ancient Rome, art, sculpture, and antiquities were carted northward back to genteel libraries and drawing rooms and galleries of townhouses and country seats alike, immersing the British public in the classical past. With the influx of objects and interest fueled by a system of education that favored anti antiquity, a classical literacy saturated British society, which became well-versed in the names, myths, and legends of classical mythology. Gods, goddesses, muses, and graces were invoked in plays, poetry, pamphlets, and periodicals, seep, stepping in as archetypes for the young, the fashionable, and the beautiful. William Hogarth articulated this in his well-known um, analysis of beauty from 1753, which he visualized uh, in plate one of his serpentine line. In the plate, we see the central figure of the Venus de Medici, who is bordered by Hogarth's serpent serpentine line of beauty delineated in various forms, including chair legs, flora, and the curvature of whalebone stays. The idealized proportions of the sculptures of Venus, in particular the Medici Venus, came to represent the flawless female form. Viewers and lawyers alike described her as the perfect model of female beauty. As her prominent position in the center of Hogarth's print attests, Venus, the goddess of beauty and love, was central to this awareness and adoption of classical archetypes in popular culture, becoming shorthand for the contemporary female beauties or women of fashion. Venus, or women of fashion, or a woman of fashion 30 years later, different, differed significantly in her proportions to that of the ancient goddess delineated in Hogarth's print. And we can see this most vividly in a pair of drawings owned by Horace Walpole. Given to Walpole by his sister, Maria Churchill, the original drawing portrays a female nude in a reminiscent pose to that of the Medici Venus. Upon it, Walpole sent the drawing to his longtime correspondent and little Countess of Upper Ossery on the 27th of January, 1786, entreating, quote, I beg leave to enclose a Venus of the present hour in her purest non naturalibus. The drawing was made by a young lady at Bath and given to me by my sister. It diverted me so much that I gave it to Kergate with leave to have it engraved for his own benefit, and I think he would sell hundreds of them. The exchange of drawings, prints, and gifts was not uncommon for Walpole, and his circle and the circulation of visual and material culture contributed both to his growing collections of treasures at Strawberry Hill and the collections of others. His closest friend, Horace Mann, once remarked that he cannot look around the house without seeing presents from Walpole, and Walpole sent drawings to Lady Orsary on multiple occasions. Beneath the drawing, Walpole identified the sitter and the art, sorry, not the sitter, the artist, as Miss Hoare of Bath, next to the year 1785, referring to the portraitist and history painter, Mary Hoare. Hoare was a member of an artistic family, the daughter of portraitist William Hoare, who had painted Walpole's sister the year prior to her marriage in 1742. And we can see her on the left, sorry, the right, um, and sister of sculpture Prince Hoare. To your left, my right, the portrait. Um, as, as a young woman, she had been encouraged to copy suitable old masters like Nicholas Poussin's Hercules Between Vice and Virtue and elevating subjects such as virtue and peace, health and temperance. Compared with her known surviving works, largely assorted pastel portraits, classicized tableaus and scenes of Shakespeare, of which I've pulled a selection here from YCBA, the drawing that Walpole received and presented to his friend is a rather unexpected departure from the typical artistic production of a woman. For example, and or even a nude by a woman, we can see this in the nude by Hoare's contemporary, Mary Moser. Hoare's pen and ink drawing given to Walpole is titled in Hoare's hand, A Modern Venus, or A Lady in the Present Fashion in the State of Nature. <laughs> the drawing depicts a full-length nude woman standing in profile with two rather outstanding features. <laughs> Beneath a long mane of flowing curls and a diminutive face, we have a pair of orb-like breasts and a protruding posterior that echoes the contemporary fashionable silhouette of the mid-1780s. Twisting the Latin phrase in purest naturalibus, Walpole identifies the modern Venus in a state of non-natural nudity. 
Upon receipt of the drawing, Orsi returned it along with a second version titled A Modern Venus Closed. Having traced the contours, Osiris dressed her with an oversized brim hat, a puffed handkerchief, and gown. The Osiris letter and that accompanied the drawing does not survive. On the 10th of February, Walpole replied thanking her for, quote, feathering his Venus. The amplified figure of this nude and her added feathers portray the satirized corporeal effects of structural underwear and accessories on the body. The contours of this modern Venus are shaped not by nature, as Walpole alludes in his Latin phrase, but by fashion. The comic extremity of fashion perceived and fashion's perceived effect in 1785 was articulated in Hoare and Ossery's drawings. And in the final stage of this exchange, the engraving of the drawing by Horace Walpole's private secretary and printer, Thomas Kergate, into a satirical print. Mm -hmm. Thus, in 1786, a modern Venus or a lady of the present fashion in the state of nature, 1786, was engraved, sold, printed and sold by Edward Yardley, bookseller and print seller at number two, New in Passage, just off the Strand in London. This paper considers the exchange and relationship between fashion worn, fashion observed, fashion drawn, fashion shared, and fashion printed through the medium of satirical prints. Of the multiple domestic revolutions that occurred in the latter decades of the 18th century, including consumption, enlightenment thinking, and budding industrialization, this paper considers the revolution in print culture as a catalyst for fashionable change. As one anonymous author mused in 1785, quote, what in all the material world is so light, so fleeting, and so volatile as fashion? It is like the froth which bubbling on the surface of the stream is forever changing its shape in insensible gradations. This paper locates fashion or fashionable dress in the conversations about it, the images portraying it, and the artifacts left in its wake. It argues that the garments that shaped Hor's Venus, structural underwear and accessories, were the key ingredients to the recipe for fashion and fashionable change. It is her stays, her bum, her bouffant handkerchief that sculpt her body into the fashionable silhouette of the mid 80s, enabling her to traverse the gardens and theaters and watering places of the emergent urban, urban landscape of the late 18th century. As new fashionable places expanded beyond the ritual and formality of court life, the variety of fashionable dress expounded in a period defined by the developments and revolution that was by development and revolution that witnessed unparalleled change politically, socially, and economically, as well as globally, fashion can be viewed as the most immediate medium that women employed to navigate this evolving world. In particular, this paper considers the role of one accessory, the handkerchief or bouffant, not only in shaping the fashionable silhouette, but acting as a representative case study for how satirical prints not only reflective or reactive to fashionable change, but were also instigators and active players in the construction of 18th century fashionability. Since the Renaissance, the silhouette of the female dressed body bore little resemblance to the corporeal body beneath. The torso was structured and the line of the skirt extended away from the hips and the legs. The fashionable silhouette of the mid uh, decades of the 18th century was populated by wide skirted mantuas, sacks, and court dress that displayed the finely woven, painted, and embroidered textiles to their best advantage. These gowns were supported by hoops and panniers beneath and conical stays shaped the torso. And we can see that in the painted silk example um, there. By the latter 1760s, however, fashion had found new venues for its display and um, the stricter sartorial codes of court uh, lessened and therefore birthed more opportunities and more designs in the fashionable silhouette. The Polonaise, Luke, English, and Italian styles shifted emphasis from a horizontal plane across the hips that highlighted the quality of the textile towards an architectural body formed of sculptural pleats and gathers around the rear. And we can see this completed look visually in this moralizing genre painting, a lady and her children relieving a co cottager by William Redmore Biggs. And this is a really rare example of the depiction of this style. I'm talking about the woman in pink. Um, as at the time, portraiture favored depicting sitters as timeless, uh, adopting classicized drapery and historicized or exotic costume rather than a rather unhelpful trend in portraiture for the dress historian. Mm -hmm. 
In okay. contrast, the fashionable dress of the lady, whose charity is very magnanimously bestowed upon both the poor white woman as well as the liveried black serving boy, acts as a timestamp temp that temporally connects the painting with contemporary concerns of charity and abolition. Drawn the following year, the figure of the modern Venus reflects an exaggerated version of the fashionable silhouette of the mid to late 80s, which represents the final peak in architectural artificiality before fashion plummets towards the natural body in clinging gowns of the 1790s and beyond. However, this paper argues the garment that facilitates these fantastic forms were not the gowns themselves, but rather the structural underwear worn beneath and the amplifying accessories worn above. To the 18th century wearer and observer of fashion, the artificiality of the silhouette was not only well known, but a subject unto itself. Comparing the amplified constructions of the sartorial body with the natural body was a common motif within contemporary graphic satire. For instance, A Pig in a Poke, published on the 6th of February, 1786 by James Phillips, portrays two depictions of the same woman back to back both modeled on the pose of the Venus de' Medici, a miniature statuette of whom uh, stands on the plinth um, right beside her head. Like the modern Venus, one is nude and the other is clothed. On the left, the woman is fully dressed from top to tail in the amplifications of the current fashion. A large feathered hat, puffed handkerchief and swelling bum lifts the back of her blue gown. On the right, her unsympathetically drawn nude body is displayed withered and nearly skeletal. Stripped of the luscious volume her clothes create, her false bum, yellow petticoat, and blue gown are scattered at her feet. Two months later, this motif was employed again in Eve and her granddaughter in the modern Eden. Published by William Hollard on the 1st of April, 1786. Set within a landscape reminiscent of a country parkland, a nude Eve, right hand placed for modesty, gestures with disbelief to her granddaughter on the left, who is portrayed as a chaotic sartorial menagerie of ribbons and ruffles with a caged bird crowning her hat and a cat with kittens resting on her incredibly colossal bum. Like Hor's modern Venus, her enormous bare breasts are displayed, protruding from a very, a very low cut gown in stark contrast to the delicate apples of Eve. The juxtapositions of these pairs of women playfully emphasize the role of fashion as both a method of creating or distorting beauty in the fashionable body. However, when this, uh, when this dichotomy is employed in depictions of non-white women, the contrast is far more cutting and loaded, often distinguishing civility, familiarity, and contrast with otherness. We can see this in the portrayals of North American indigenous women, as well as women of the African diaspora. To that point, the modern Venus, um, to the modern viewer, the corporeal contours of Hor's modern Venus and the pow powder pigeon silhouette more broadly can arguably not be seen without drawing a parallel to the representations of Sarah Bartman published over 20 years later. Bartman was born in present day South Africa in the 1770s and died in France between December 1815 or in January 1816. Contemptu contemptuously advertised as the hot and top Venus, Bartman's nearly naked body was first exhibited for popular consumption in London 1810. And as we can see in this print um, by SW Fours, um, which actually has all three as um, as exhibitions. Um, and you can see if you if you scroll in and if you zoom in, you can see to be seen at and where effectively people where they're actually advertised, um, you know, you can actually go and see them. Um, and as Robin Mitchell has argued, signified for the white paying public, an early colonial trope of savagery and otherworldness. Always portrayed in profile to highlight the curvature of her hind parts, the image was widely circulated, her image was widely circulated in the British and French print markets, cementing a visual legacy of exoticism, racism, and racism, excuse me, and the commodification of the other. While specific fashions like 1780s frizzed hair and the Madras head wrap have demonstrated the global influence of African and Caribbean style in London, the privileged seat of fashion overwhelmingly favored whiteness as its palette. As Charmaine Nelson has argued, marble's absence of color from which sculptures of Venus were carved reinforced a racially constructed idea of beauty dominant throughout the 18th and 19th centuries 
one that has remained a requisite of fashion. And this fashionability of whiteness extended beyond skin color to textiles. When Lady Ossery returned a modern Venus clothes, she covered the voluptuous exposed bosom with the folds of a handkerchief, the accessory that defined the upper part of what today is commonly known as the powder pigeon silhouette. Named after the English bird whose jutting breast feathers and tail form a similar profile, and you can see them just at the bottom mm -hmm. in the center. Um, the powder pigeon silhouette reached its peak in the mid to late 1780s. The nickname first appeared in print in 1785 in relation to the amplification of the bosom, lifted by stays beneath and augmented by wearing a handkerchief above. The term was later used by romantic poet Robert Southey in 1807 and has largely remained in circulation due to Dorothy George's adoption of Southey's description in her tombs of graphic satires in the British Museum. While the handkerchief was not a new accessory, it has been both, it was worn both by men and women across the socioeconomic spectrum throughout the century, its position as a fashionable appendage took prominence in the 1780s. Worn about the neck, the large folded square or triangular textile could either be pinned or tucked into the front of the stays or was later worn crossed and tied around the back of the waist. Though handkerchiefs were made from a variety of textiles, including linen, silk, cotton, some of which were decoratively printed for commemoration, the most fashionable were made of muslin and became known commonly as bouffants. The term bouffant borrowing from the French was first advertised in 1788 and became the primary term replacing the handkerchief or neckerchief and was largely made um, of muslin, lawn, or gauze ornamented with white work, embroidery, netting, or lace. They were advertised from four shillings and six pence to two shillings and six pence, slightly less than other articles of fine cottons like aprons and caps, their cost reflecting, reflecting the caliber of the textile rather than its maker's labor. However, prices ranged. In 1778, for example, Elizabeth Motley Austin bought two worked muslin handkerchiefs for 10 shillings and on November 4th, and Lady Mary Delawar uh, bought a bouffon for her daughter on February 6th for seven shillings and six pence. Once the ban on imported cottons had been repealed in 1774, fine cottons became increasingly incorporated into fashion, favored for their lightness and translucence. As seen in this portrait of Margot Wheatley, painted as part of a pair with her husband, William Wheatley in 1786 by Francis Alnay, the near translucent quality of the fabric simultaneously covered the neckline, but allowed the decolletage to be seen beneath, while also adding the perception of volume above the natural curvature of the breast. This voluminous, voluminous effect was achieved through clear starching or crimping of the fabric, manual processes that like laundering, were continuously required to maintain both the whiteness desired and the shape of the fabric. Like Wheatley's cap and her husband's cuffs, the manual effort required to keep white white and the delicate textile starch was a marker for social status throughout the early modern period. To this effect, Milner's advertised, quote, the fonts cleaned and dressed. Instructional manual, instruction manuals were published in ladies' cookery books, outlining methods for clear starching, and portable machines were advertised for crimping bouffants of all sizes to remedy the inconvenience of sending bouffants to town to crimp. In addition to knowledge of dressing, hair, and millinery, ladies' maids were sought after who understood clear starching and clearing, cleaning of bouffants or bouffant crimping, emphasizing that in the 1780s, the desired volume was equally as important as the whiteness and fineness of the textile itself. The amplified effect was not lost, on the commentators of fashion who propagated the newspapers with commentaries and diatribes of the reigning fashions of the day, whose snide remarks and comic asides were visualized in satirical prints. In a column titled The Levities of Fashion, published in 1785, the anonymous author quips, quote, the stomacher or chest piece is also a levity in fashion. This is something like a porch which opens with an inviting aspect to every stranger. It is cut with such a fine oval and ample sweep as to convey no inadequate idea of that easy protuberance, that delicate swell, which is not the least perfection in the mode of the feminine shape. 
Within satirical circles, the pleasing effect and or emphasis of the heave and quote, delicious swell of the breast inspired the name a merry thought to be used, a term whose double entendre was clearly visualized in this print by fours. The light airy textiles were conceived to be held aloft even with wire or with the quote, by admission of elastic globes repeat with gas. To use helium to inflate the breast was visualized in a new conveyance to the regions of folly where the ladies balloon dress for the year 1786, where again, the erotic appeal blended with the perceived scale of the powder pigeon. Mimicking the dress of the year format, the print portrays a woman in pink and green in a pink and green striped gown hanging suspended from a canopy, which resembles the top of a hot air balloon. The flight of Vincenzo Lunardi's hot air balloon in 1784 had caused balloon mania to sweep through fashion like a contagion. As one columnist reported in August 1784, the balloon influenza rages with more violence than ever, added to balloon hats, balloon bonnets, balloon caps, balloon ribbons, and balloon pins. The ladies are now, now have a double balloon earrings and balloon side curls, so that there are no less than seven balloon articles appertaining to the decoration of the most beautiful balloon in nature, the head of a pretty woman. While hats and caps were the most common and easily adaptable fashionable incarnations of balloon mania, in the print, the woman herself was ballooned from toe, from top to toe, with a rope tied to each nipple and two, and two attached to her bum. Suggestively, a fop, potentially Lunardi himself, straddles the swell of her bum um, over her waist. Waving a Union Jack flag that flutters in the wind, the woman is presented as a whim whimsical, eroticized convergence of fashion and patriotism. As British, as British fashion flies ever further into the, quote, regions of folly. The extremity of this print, whose body echoes the extremity of Hoare's modern Venus, was accompanied by a flock of earthbound pigeons, restricted by their size of their puffed bouffants from eating soup, kissing a bow, or keeping a healthy social distance from their companions. <clears throat> the women of 1786 were portrayed on the printed page, quote, full cropped before just like a pouting pigeon, dovetailed behind and bustling like a widgeon, from neck to heel observing Hogarth's line, all in and out perfect serpentine. This concern with scale of the bouffant was not limited to satire. German uh, diarist Sophie Van La Roche, who made numerous observations on English dress during her travels to London in 1786, noted scornfully on September 7th that the, quote, metaphorical goddess of fashion suffers from quotidian fever, which at a certain degree of heat turns to madness. Evidence of this madness was four women who, upon entering a box at the theater, were quote, received by the entire audience with loud derision due to their wonderfully fantastic caps and hats perched on their heads and their neckerchiefs were puffed so high that their noses were scarce visible. In the format of a pantomime call and response, four members of the cast quickly left the stage and reappeared, um, dressed equally foolishly and hailed the four ladies in the box as their friends, resulting in the ladies eventual departure from the theater. Much like evic the evicted women, the style of wearing very large bouffants soon too departed. In Society News on May 1st, 1787, the newspaper reported optimistically that, quote, the pouting handkerchief for the neck is very much on the decline. A large bouquet of natural or artificial flowers adorns the bosom of our bells. They could not have devised an ornament more becoming, indicating that once again the wheel of fashion was turning. Though handkerchiefs would continue to be worn through the end of the century, their scale deflated as the scale of the overall silhouette. When once the commentators of fashion were horrified by the amplification of the body, within a mere year, couple of years, they became equally aghast at its natural exposure when the deflated breast was laid bare through muslin's clinging form and braired breast were actually on display. And we can see this trajectory of fashion visually through the representation of the handkerchief and the powder pigeon silhouette from surviving prints from 1784 to 1790. And I've done this, I'm going to take you on a very quick tour um, uh, of these collections using the Lewis Walpole Library and the British Museum uh, as representative of um, 
argued two of the largest print collections. So if we jump back to 1784, we can start to see, you have the bomb already, but you can start to see the handkerchief appearing. And this is the British Museum's version. So again, it doesn't quite have that silhouette yet. It's not as amplified. Going into 1785, you're again starting to see it getting a little bit curvier, a little bit more serpentine. And the romp is where we can really start to see that coming into, into practice, into vision. And if we keep going, we hit 1786. So again, by now we're in full swing of the powder pigeon at its most extreme. And these are continued from the British Museum, not trying to overlap any. 1787, we're just as um, strong. This is just a much a focus um, of print collectors, collections. And again, the British Museum. 1788, we're still in that we're still, it's still there, you can still see it, but again, we're starting to soften. We're slightly starting to change. And again, with 1788, there's also less of them. So this is going through all of these collections by year. Um, so again, we're seeing a decline in the number um, as representative. Again, still there, but starting, the bun's starting to get a little bit smaller. The overall proportions aren't quite as S-like. And again, 1789 from the British Museum. And then by 1790, you again are starting to see a much more clingy and much straighter silhouette. And you've got a couple here as well, um, just to give you that very fast run through of a couple of years of collections. So this rise and fall of the handkerchief or bouffant presents a micro history of fashionable dress for the second half of the 1780s. Widely worn and emblematic of the prominent position that one small accessory could occupy, its presence on the fashionable body was conspicuous and pervasive. Unlike the material world the, and lightness, which was captured in oil by the delicate brushwork of portraitists like Francis Almay, the fragile extant, extant textiles that are now in museum stores lie flat, carefully conserved and protected from further damage and discoloration. Despite their plentiful survival within museum collections, our understanding of the handkerchief's presence on the 18th century body is largely informed through description, like that of Van der Rosche's, and through its visual portrayal. Visual culture has always been a vital lens that can help us see and understand how garments appeared and were worn, even when extant examples still exist. The study of dress has long relied on painted portraiture to reconstruct the quote ephemeral but vital arts of the tailor, dressmaker, or hairdresser, and replace the lost body that once occupied extant material objects, offering tantalizing glimpses into the dress of the past. Carefully agreed upon constructions between sitter, painter, and painter and patron, the images on the painted canvas follow their own sartorial and artistic conventions portraying what was popular to be painted wearing and not necessarily what was worn. Arguably the fashion for half-length portraits of women with precise confections of hair and headwear and a puffed handkerchief at the breast like Mrs. Wheatley's participates within its own fashionable convention. This paper posits what of those garments that painted portraiture excluded, those either too ephemeral or short-lived to be immortalized in oils or far too beneath the formality of the genre deemed to be polite. It asks, why do we favor the portrait of Mrs. Wheatley um, over the lady suspended by her bosom and bum like a hot air balloon in our quest to understand 18th century dress? Traditionally, satirical prints have been viewed with mild con uh, concern to scathing contempt when considered in relation to dress. Influentially, Doris Langley Moore asserted that due to her, their often exaggerated and distorted effects, the quote, parodies of fashion must be ruled out prioritizing fashion plates instead. By contrast, advocates for the medium, including print scholars like Diana Donald, have argued that satires have a quote, scale and panache which convey the fashionable look far more effectively than the frozen and timid manner of contemporary fashion plates and pocketbook illustrations. Somewhere in between these opposing opinions, Lou Taylor has tepidly endorsed the use of satirical prints as quote, a gauge of period 
reaction to dress rather than their reliable depictions of style. And rather than hinging on over-reliability or accuracy, this paper approaches graphic satires as a rich and fruitful source that were active players within the construction of fashion in the late 18th century, building much more on the work of Peter McNeil, whose research into print culture, macaronis, and fashion have been instrumental in reframing this relationship of satirical prints and dress, not as deterrents of fashionable excess, but instigators of fashionable innovation. And we can continue to develop, develop that uh, vibrant cycle of dialogues and exchanges between style and satire, establishing a symbolic relationship between women's fashion and print culture. Sorry, symbiotic, not symbolic. The world of fashion and print um, was expressly intertwined. Over the second half of the 18th century, the publication of newspapers and periodicals grew considerably, providing more, ever more column inches for fashion news, as well as those seeking to report on the comments or comment on the latest levity or fashionable whim, both pleasing or vexing to the public eye. 1770 saw the publication of the Ladies Magazine or Entertaining Companion for the Fair Sex, the first British monthly fashion magazine, which acted as a departure from the pocketbook format that had been and would continue to print fashionable news and fashion plates. Published monthly, the Ladies Magazine brought fashionable news, embroidery patterns, and occasional fashion plates to its subscribers, extending the reach of fashion outside the metropolis. And you can find much more um, on the Ladies Mag in uh, Jenny Batchelor's work, um, which helpfully has all of the patterns digitized. Thank you, Jenny. Um, the fashion plate has often elevated as a font of authentic fashionable knowledge, especially in opposition to satirical prints. However, recent scholarship has challenged that prominence of the fashion plate, and instead we can view it as just one branch of the periodical press, which acted as a partner to the production and consumption of fashion itself. And Serena Dyer has argued that print culture acts as a, quote, sartorial timekeeper, a temporal arbiter of women's material lives. The paths of print and dress are playfully, evocatively, and intimately connected. The print and um, the printed page where fashion was reported and discussed, denigrated and promoted. More than a passive timekeeper, however, this paper positions print culture as a catalyst and a firebrand, echoing the revolutionary sparks of change that was struck throughout the period. While the fashion periodical and press may have tacked on whose pages um, tracked fashion's temporal evolution, it is in their insatiable and unrestrained sister the satirical print where spirit, freedom, and boldness are allowed to thrive. Aligning the satirical and the sartorial, this paper has championed the genre of graphic satire as a medium in which underwear and accessories were not only portrayed, but flourished as potent motifs of weighted iconography. Fashion's role in graphic satire blossomed over the last four decades of the 18th century with print sellers and satirists like John Collette, Matthew and Mary Darley, Richard Brinsley Sheridan, Carrington Bowes, and Samuel, Samuel William Fors, whose sharp eyes and wit were as piercing as their styluses. They employed dress as loaded symbols of um, society, politics, class, and gender, and like fashion periodicals, extended the narrow realm of who could consume fashion materially. The consumption of prints, which could be purchased from one to two shillings, plain and hand colored respectively, extended beyond those whose fashions they satirized or whose pockets could pay for them. While they favored portrayals of the Beaumont, satires were awash with social climbers, country interlopers, and those who wore but did not wield fashion. Fashionable dress and those who wore it or aspired to it provided not only inspiration and comic material for satirical prints, but a language of motifs and understood by the viewing public. The speed of satirical prints kept up with the pace of fashion, unlike fashion plates whose images often lagged behind the current mode. And prints were displayed in print shop windows and bookstores, out in coffee shops and pinned up for sale on the streets. Print shops, milliners, stay makers, and mantua makers, and the ever specializing branches of the sartorial trades were nestled within London streets and townhouses. The proximity between the printmaker and make the makers and wearers of fashion was sometimes as close as within the same room, fueling the fervent dialogues between dress and satirical prints. For example, at a masked ball at the London Opera House in April 24th, 1775. 
amidst the elegant little shops in which gloves, ribbons, and feathers, jewels, and toys of all sorts to be sold, a, col a columnist in the, in the Morning Post and Daily Advertiser noted that Matt Darley selling off his old stock and taking caricatures to lay a new one in for the spring trade. The following day, along with descriptions printed in the newspapers of the mask, a pair of satirical prints, four of the masquerade goers attired in their masquerade ensembles were published by the Darleys. And two months later, reports of those masquerade, masquerade costumes had crossed the Atlantic and were published in the Virginia Gazette. While the heart of satirical and sartorial production is arguably London-centric, satirical prints carried along, alongside letters, newspapers, and clothes to Calcutta, Virginia, Massachusetts, and South Carolina, etc. Like the latest fashions just imported from London, so too did the images of fashion circulate across the globe. Imported humorous prints were advertised up and down the East Coast and produced alongside America's budding art market. One seller, James McCall, in Charleston, South Carolina, advertised in 1773 the largest print, plain and colored, some very humorous, some dressed in the present taste. The visual material and discursive incarnations of fashion reached from the neighborhoods of the West End and the city to the edges of the empire. We can view the portrayal of fashion in graphic satire not as a taboo of exaggeration of dress, but one that is sartorially aware and cognizant of material construction. By the cultural, but of the cultural appropriation of dress within society. The inclusion of graphic satire within dress history methodologies invites us, invites the question of why did the late 18th century see such extremes of these peripheral garments that shaped the female silhouette? Were these drastic trends in style, such as bouffants, bums, and big hair, merely the cylinder, the cyclical products? of fashion coming to an extremity at the end of the century before dissipating? Were they molded by the external social and political forces of the time, such as the American War of Independence, the growing pains of the expanding empire and the age of revolution, where consumers were more able to buy, industrialization made things more available to sell, and print made fashion more accessible to consume? Or can we consider the influence of graphic satire itself? Jumping back in time a little bit, in his tomb of seven, in 1967, fashion history writing of the dress worn in the decades just prior to the French Revolution, Francois Boucher attributes the quote, excessive changeability of fashion was a sign of the worldly boredom, which was once a century's ills, implying that the excess of bouffants puffed, hats fashioned, bums satire um, stuffed, etc., was merely the result of the desire to fill a languid life. However, I would argue that this changeability of fashionable underwear and accessories is not the product of boredom, but rather of keen observation, wit, and commerce. The field of graphic satire was primed, interpreting fashionable change and translating it into the satirical body um, within a night. Print culture, specifically graphic satire itself, was the liquid primer that fueled fashion's rapid turns. In the so-called golden age of characters, fashion itself thrived, pushing boundaries and making innovations, expanding the branches of the sartorial trades and solidifying the temporal rhythm that we would come to be recognized as the fashion cycle. Through the medium of graphic satire, though the medium of graphic satire would continue to flourish, the main players of the 90s and 1800s, including James Gilray and Thomas Rowlandson, lost interest in representing the material world and developing a more stylized, abstract manner of depicting figures and thereby aligning their portrayals of dress to the Grecian lines of the Regency, like changing tastes in satire. We may be satisfied to chart these sartorial differences as coordinates on the trajectory of fashion, whose pendulum of shape and silhouette oscillates from extreme to extreme, swinging upwards again by the following decades. Big would again be back with puff sleeves, looped hair, and belled skirts of the 1820s. So in conclusion, the study of this paper and the book from which it from which it draws realizes a pre excuse me, a prediction foretold by the anonymous commentator in August 1785. Following a list of underwear and accessories, including hats, bums, handkerchiefs, he penned, quote, such are a few of those exterior levities most in fashion. How this sovereign arbitress of human destiny affects the minds, sentiments, and hearts of our fair countrywomen may probably be the subject of some future lucubration. The author invites us to lucubrate or to study or meditate 
upon the levities most in fashion and their effects on the minds, sentiments, and hearts of British women in the late 18th century. Following this prediction, this paper addresses and explores how those levities with special focus on the handkerchief as a representative case study of underwear and accessories defined the pace of fashionable change in the late 18th century. In a period defined by significant political, social, and cultural change, the fashionable silhouette expanded and contracted dramatically, propelled by fashion's underlying relationship with print. Like the contours of Hoare's modern Venus, we can see that the position of underwear and accessories in defining fashion, we can also see how the position of print culture print culture has shaped it. Not merely a passive observer or a recorder, print culture mediated fashion through its descriptions, reports, patterns, and representations. Looking beyond the fashion plate, we can elevate graphic satire as a key primary source of dress history and fashion history. Bridging the sartorial and the satirical, the study argues that the connection between satirical prints and dress was a catalyst that fueled fashion's course and its ever-changing shape by insensible gradations. Thanks very much.